Welcome back. We're talking about Iran 39 years after the Islamic Revolution. Let's get back to our panel. Dorothy Pavez is a global policy reporter with Think Progress. Mohsen Milani is a professor of politics at the University of South Florida. And Trita Parsi is founder and president of the National Iranian American Council. Dorothy, let me start with you this time. And I just want to get your view on what we were talking about a moment ago, and that is um, the nuclear deal. Um, when we look at what happens, you know, President Obama, of course, championed that deal. He pushed it through. Now we have President Trump. He wants to scrap that deal. Do you think it's going to survive? <laughs> um, if, if, I, if only I could tell. Yeah. Um, I mean, that largely depends on how the Trump administration proceeds and also how uh, the European partners in the deal proceed. Um, they seem to have the will to stay within the deal. Uh, and there is some European investment still ongoing in Iran. Um, but you know, this, if Trump decides to pull out, ultimately, that will undo the deal, probably. And, um, if that's a response to his fears that Iran is becoming too much of a major regional player, he's at a huge disadvantage because of location, location, location. Iran is there. Iran has history with all these right. surrounding countries, um, but the U.S. doesn't. And the history that it does have largely with countries like Lebanon, with countries like Syria, with, uh, you know, um, countries like Iraq, it's, they're not positive histories. So. All right, I want to stay with you and talk about some of these social issues in mm -hmm. Iran. Uh, let's talk about women's rights since mm -hmm. the revolution. Uh, quite a bit of the conversation recently has been focusing on the wearing of the hijab or the headscarf uh, in Iran. Let's listen to some views. Let's watch this. I believe the hijab should not be mandatory. Every woman knows what she's doing and should be able to choose either the right path or the wrong path. It's not a general movement. If you ask women in society, they are fine with wearing the hijab as long as they can wear it the way they like. Only a small minority is being hostile and protesting. Now, contrary to a lot of what we see and hear here in the United States, and if we compare women in Iran, say, to other Gulf states like Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates, women have relatively uh, far more rights, don't they? Well, of course, uh, you know, women in Iran uh, can be members of parliament. They can certainly drive, could attend universities. It's not the repressive state that, you know, it's, it's not a homogenous region, so it's not the same as a lot of these Gulf uh, Arab countries. Having said that, I mean, things could always be better. You know, women in Iran protest usually for a reason. Now, the hijab is, is a, one of those small token obvious things. And realistically speaking, uh, you won't hear women saying they want the hijab banned. They just don't want to be forced to all wear it in the same way all the time. It has to be a, a, a free expression of one's faith, not something that's mandated by the state. Uh, Mohsen, how significant uh, or how important a constituency are young people, is young, uh, are young people in Iran? Uh, I mean, we have a whole group of young people now, uh, the majority in Iran, who are connected to the Internet, increasingly educated. How significant are they? Extremely significant. If, again, if we go back to 1979 revolution and look at the reason why we had this revolution, this unexpected revolution in Iran, a country where a year before 1979, President Carter called it an island of stability in one of the more troubled regions of the world, you would find out that one major reason was that under the Shah's government, Iranian economy grew, we made tremendous social progress. Iranian society had become vibrant. And yet, the political system in Iran remained autocratic and despotic. I submit to you that we are facing a similar situation today in Iran. In other words, Iranian society in the past 40 years uh, has fundamentally changed. It has become much more literate. It has become much more urbanized. It has become much more wired, and people are demanding to have political freedom and personal and private freedoms. And unless the Islamic Republic doesn't make some moves and reform the system, I'm afraid that we are going to go through a period of instability and chaos in the coming decade. Uh, Motion, are you confident that the Republic will respond to those uh, demands, those grievances? I think President Rouhani is really uh, trying to make some changes. As a matter of fact, in his uh, speech uh, on the 39th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution, 
he has opened the Pandora's box by suggesting that we might have a referendum in Iran, which I think is a very smart move by the president. If he succeeds in uh, going ahead with this referendum, he can really undermine his opponents. What do you think, Trita? Is the political and religious establishment in Iran responsive? Are they aware of what's going on? Clearly not sufficiently. You wouldn't have had these protests otherwise. Uh, and I think Dr. Milani is absolutely right that uh, there has to be a, a greater um, synchronization between the economic development and the political development. Because as the economic development moves in a certain direction, people's expectations also grow. And we're not seeing that translated into political changes in the pace that people are expecting. And one of the biggest problems that the Islamic Republic is facing is that if people lose faith that actually change can come from within, through the ballot box, through peaceful organizing, uh, etc., uh, if they lose faith in that, that's when they will start looking for other avenues. And that would be a far greater challenge to the political stability of the country. Dorothy, uh, what about the external threats to Iran? Uh, there is a view that they, the two main branches of Islam, uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, um, are battling each other for supremacy. Iran leads the charge for the Shia. Uh, branch of Islam in Saudi Arabia, the Sunni, and we're seeing that in proxy wars that are being fought in places like Syria and Yemen. How much of a threat is that to Iran? I think actually the greater threat to Iran is probably internal instability. Um, and, you know, Western partners should be aware of that because Iran, for all of its problems, it's still relatively stable. Um, and take a look at the neighborhood it's in. So, to the extent to which a government like Saudi Arabia poses a threat, I'm not that concerned about it. I'm more concerned about the instability that could come from within, um, because as sort of these economic woes and social woes continue, if the government doesn't respond, um, you know, you're going to look at like this, this momentum that's going to build up. You know, the, the Islamic Revolution didn't happen overnight. It was decades and decades of problems and, and unanswered needs and, and, and repression that brought it about. Are we going to look at a similar situation? Trita, go ahead. I think uh, Dorothy is quite correct. The one area where I think this very uh, destructive competition and rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia could become a threat to the Iranians is the fact that these woes that do, these concerns that exist within society can be exploited by those who are actually uh, exporting uh, sectarianism. We have seen that in elsewhere. And when the situation is bad, that's when suddenly some of these uh, Salafi uh, ideologies become attractive to certain segments of society. The Iranians are quite concerned about this because many of the problems that exist in the country are even more severe in the border areas where you have ethnic and religious minorities. If they then become susceptible to some of these ideologies that are coming out of Saudi Arabia, then that certainly is a threat. Mohsen, when we look at uh, these threats that Iran is facing right now, I mean, are those threats aggravated by the fact that the United States is, uh, well, it's expressing, it's giving more support to uh, Iran's um, rival, Saudi Arabia? Well, uh, going back to the question you asked, I too believe that the greatest source of uh, uh, concern uh, for the stability of Iran is what is taking place inside Iran. I don't see at this time a high probability of another country invading Iran. However, I do see the, uh, the possibility of some kind of military confrontation between Iran and Israel because Iran is trying to open up a new front against Israel inside Syria. And uh, Mr. Netanyahu has been on record a number of times saying that Israel will not accept an Iranian military presence in Syria. I'm not that concerned about Saudi Arabia, although the competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia is the, uh, is the deriving, uh, driving force of what is taking place in the Middle East. I am much more concerned about the possibility of some kind of confrontation or some kind of miscalculation by Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah versus Israel. That is the greatest source of tension, in my judgment, at this time in the Middle East. And that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. But the conversation continues online. Join us on CGTN America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at CGTN America. I'm Arlen Leider in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.